couple of things before before I start. First and foremost, the war did not start on the 24th of February 2022. Mm -hmm. The war started with the Russian onslaught um, and the attempts to um, back uh, militarily separatists in Luhansk and uh, Donetsk area in 2014 and with an accession of Crimea uh, in the spring of 2014. So the war um, uh, simply became different um, or became kind of um, uh, in your face, an open uh, stage uh, war um, in February last year, number one. Number two, I would like to thank very much um, uh, Ted uh, Tadeusz, um, for organizing this lecture, and um, I would like to thank uh, Jerusalem um, National Library of Israel uh, for um, sponsoring uh, this lecture. Um, I started my career as, um, as a scholar coming from Ukraine, teaching in the West, uh, with a lecture in um, in this library in 2000, in 2000, uh, uh, excuse me, in 1993, so many years ago, um, and um, I am uh, very grateful to uh, those who came then to listen to me and to you for participating in this conversation. So uh, before uh, before I turn to my five points that I would like to elucidate here, um, uh, let me uh, just say a couple of things. Uh, usually, uh, when I am uh, giving this kind of um, uh, lectures, I use um, sophisticated PowerPoint, uh, twenty slides with all sorts of uh, uh, visual texts, um, and uh, and I have a, a written text. Um, today, we have a different uh, type of a conversation. I would like to be more interactive and more conversational. So instead of presenting to you a ready-made, uh, ready-to-go uh, lecture with a ready-to-go PowerPoint, I would like to have more flexibility. So I allow myself um, a different format. Um, I have uh, several points to make and uh, several key, um, uh, several um, uh, case studies to illustrate my points. And then I would like to hear your questions and answer as many questions as I can, um, um, taking in consideration that I would accept questions and not statements. Uh, my second caveat is that um, please uh, take into consideration that I am a historian, not a uh, political science pundit, and I am as a historian paid for looking back. Um, and uh, of course, among my colleagues um, in uh, Jewish history and East European history, uh, very few, if anybody, risks to portray processes unfolding in front of our eyes. That is to say, history in flux. So uh, keep in mind that uh, I'm here in quite an unusual capacity when I'm talking not about early modern history, um, uh, 16th, 17th, 18th century, not about modern Jewish history. Uh, I usually teach this history until 1948. Um, um, and um, you know everything later is either journalism or policy for me, but I'm talking about what is unfolding in front of our eyes. And um, it is kind of an unusual capacity for me. And my third caveat, is that um, when we discuss various contexts of the current Ukrainian-Russian war, uh, and Russian aggression against Ukraine, anybody has a right to claim that we are dealing with the uh, insufficient evidence. And I acknowledge that it is indeed the case. And yet, um, I am uh, monitoring the situation um, on daily basis, on hourly basis. Um, I'm talking to my friends and colleagues who are in the trenches, near Bakhmut, in the Zaporozhye district, in other parts of Ukraine. I'm talking to my students, relatives, and friends who um, join hundreds of volunteers helping the front line with drones, uh, medical equipment, um, individual military equipment, um, uh, vehicles, and so on. I'm also in contact, regular contact, with my students, friends, and colleagues who are working at the refugee centers, providing hot food um, uh, to uh, the refugees from different areas of Ukraine, uh, helping um, people uh, to um, uh, transfer across the border, helping them to settle in um, uh, Slovakia, uh, Czech Republic, uh, Hungary, um, and of course, Poland, um, perhaps also Germany. Um, so um, I'm talking to people who are helping Ukrainian refugees um, anywhere from Lviv and Chernivtsi to Vido in Spain. You would not believe that. Um, I'm monitoring uh, the situation in um, uh, using every possible media 
in in about seven to eight languages, twenty four six. Um, and of course, um, I am filtering all the um, uh, information that comes to us uh, that is poured onto me through the prism of concepts um, I advanced in my publications on Ukrainian Jewish relations. Uh, I published like six books um, uh, of which uh, five are um, obliquely and in most cases directly touching upon uh, different issues uh, related to Jewish history in Ukraine and Ukrainian Jewish relations, Ukrainian Jewish history. So having said that, uh, let me let me um, get to my five points. Um, about four years ago, um, two years before the war, um, I was speaking to a Ukrainian uh, member of the parliament um, and the owner of one of the um, uh, leading Ukrainian uh, radio stations who learned that um, I have a project um, that I call Maximilian Goldstein uh, Jewish Museum Project in Lviv, and I'm um, working toward this project uh, with an idea to establish um, a, a Jewish museum uh, of uh, Jewish artifacts um, in Lviv sometime in the future. So that person learned about um, my project and he told me, really, this is what you are doing. So let us help you with the building. Let me connect you to a number of uh, uh, local tycoons who might be interested in sponsoring the building for this museum. For, for this museum. And you know what? I was, I was really uh, flabbergasted by that. I was, I was uh, deeply astonished, uh, but, but uh, probably I should not have been because Ukrainian society has really considerably transformed itself. Um, and um, uh, from uh, the uh, society and the state that was uh, supporting official uh, late Soviet anti-Semitism and anti-Israeli stance uh, of the Cold War period um, to um, a very different society and state that shuns anti-Semitism and exhibit consistent philo-Semitic trends on all levels uh, of the society. And uh, that transformation uh, has been taking place from the late 1980s, uh, uh, more in a more pronounced way from 1991 and until today. Uh, so current war made this trend um, oh, particularly salient. Uh, this is also accurate uh, about uh, the attitude not only to the Jews, but all, also about Ukrainian society um, toward the West, uh, European conceptualization of multiculturalism, and European standards of multi-ethnic tolerance. So uh, we should not see just uh, uh, this um, transformation of the state toward, you know, uh, such that shuns anti-Semitism and uh, develops a pro-Israel stance um, um, in and of itself, but rather place it uh, within a, a larger context of uh, Ukraine that changes itself, transforms itself, and uh, becomes um, a country that presents itself, sees itself, perceives itself um, as um, a European country with strong uh, values of multiculturalism uh, that are promoted and supported on different levels of the society. Um, approximately from 1991, and uh, until um, the um, 2020s, practically every um, uh, leader, every, every president of Ukraine uh, visited Israel. And if we are talking about uh, political identities, um, uh, first and foremost, emphasizing uh, the role of the Holocaust and of the state of Israel uh, on the political agenda of this or this country or this or the politician, I would say that in addition to that, practically every Ukrainian president, whether we like him, like Viktor Yushchenko, I don't know, or whether we do not like him, uh, Viktor Yanukovych, uh, every year would appear at the Babin Yar uh, massacre site where the Nazis uh, murdered uh, 33,771 Jews um, in um, 20, on 29th and 30th of September in 1941. Um, and um, uh, that was, so, so uh, that, that is to say that every uh, Ukrainian political leader uh, participated in the commemoration of the um, massacre of the Jews as Jews, not as Soviet citizens anymore, um, uh, over the last 30 years. 
Um, Ukrainian leadership, um, again, on all levels, uh, Minister of Culture, um, uh, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Presidential Office, committed itself to protect uh, Jewish um, uh, ethnic um, uh, minority rights. Um, and uh, with this or that level of success, uh, implemented this policy over the last 30 years. Um, we can discuss in detail what goes uh, in the um, uh, sphere of Jewish education, uh, Jewish cultural pursuits, um, uh, Jewish arts, broadly conceived uh, Jewish scholarship uh, in Ukraine over the last 30 years. But um, um, I would just mention that uh, uh, there has been a proliferation of Jewish cultural institutions, educational establishments, and slow but steady inclusion of Jewish disciplines into the curriculum um, at secondary schools, especially when they teach the Holocaust, and um, at the universities when they teach uh, modern state of Israel and the Holocaust, um, in addition to that. Uh, so um, among Ukrainian elites, um, 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 I have perceived, um, and I can prove that, uh, that there was uh, raising awareness of the shared fate of Ukrainians and Jews uh, in the 20th century as two uh, uh, subalterns, as two, um, as they say, um, um, oppressed um, um, ethno-national minorities um, in uh, the Soviet Union uh, who suffered approximately at the same time, approximately, um, uh, well, of course, a different level, but approximately at the same time uh, from the same um, agents of history. Uh, so um, perhaps just because of that, uh, Ukrainians at the beginning of the war, realizing that this is a genocidal war, um, um, expressed a kind of um, um, an emotion that I can only call cri de coeur, uh, you know, crying from their hearts, um, appealing to um, Israel and Israelis, uh, asking them uh, to acknowledge uh, the agenda, genocidal war of uh, Russia against Ukrainians, compare what happened to the Jews during the Holocaust and what happens to Ukrainians uh, during this war, and um, um, asking for um, uh, not only humanitarian, but also military help. Um, of course, uh, some of my colleagues um, uh, misunderstood um, uh, this kind of discourse and started to uh, prove publicly and privately that Ukrainians are making a mistake, that it's silly to compare um, uh, what is going on to Ukrainians uh, to what is going on, uh, what is going on to Ukrainians now and what is going on to the Jews um, uh, during the Second World War. And I, in principle, agree with, uh, with, uh, with this critique, but I believe uh, uh, the critics missed the point. Uh, of course, uh, Jews um, uh, during the Second World War appeared um, in, the, um, uh, uh, in the situation when they were uh, people without territory. There was no state they, they could um, associate uh, themselves with. There was no state protecting them. There were no democratic institutions to which they, they could appeal. There was no sense uh, of importance um, uh, of uh, the support of uh, Jewish refugees or, or Jews dying in the um, um, concentration camps and or killing factories. Um, um, uh, in um, the uh, kind of world public opinion. Um, it is very different from what happens um, in uh, Ukraine um, and in Europe and also in the world today, where uh, Ukrainians do have their own state. Ukrainians uh, do have the state protecting them. Uh, they do have uh, practically um, all countries in Europe uh, supporting in this or that manner uh, Ukrainian um, uh, resistance against the Russian onslaught, and they have uh, the majority of uh, world public opinion on their side. So from this perspective, the comparison of um, uh, the Jewish fate in the Holocaust and the Ukrainian fate during the uh, Russian-Ukrainian war um, uh, doesn't make sense. But it does make sense from the perspective of, uh, of political discourse and uh, from the perspective of pragmatic goals. Uh, President Zelensky made this particular um, uh, point, uh, not because he is a historian who consulted um, uh, the key scholars in the Holocaust and uh, they explained to him, yes, you can make this particular parallel, not because of that, but because he wanted Israelis, first and foremost Israelis, to support, to extend their support to um, Ukraine, and because, um, again, uh, there is an awareness that Ukraine 
vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia is in the same situation as Israel vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, um, Iran, um, um, uh, Hezbollah, uh, Hamas, um, that is to say, under constant threat uh, of um, um, uh, uh, military uh, conflict and um, uh, invasion and uh, uh, missile attacks. Uh, so from that perspective, what Zelensky was trying to say does make sense to me. And we simply have to put that particular point um, uh, of his into a different context. But this point, uh, I believe, um, emphasizes uh, what I have been discussing, that uh, there is um, not only that particular parallel between um, Israel and Ukraine in the minds of Ukrainian politicians. Uh, this uh, particular parallelism uh, emerges uh, only due to the fact that there is a major transformation of society. Uh, Ukraine is not the country that it had been before 1991, and Ukraine develops its own unique, uh, very new understanding of how to deal with the um, uh, uh, Jewish minorities, uh, how to deal with the uh, state of Israel, and how to understand Ukrainian Jewish relations. Um, our knowledge of these transformations, um, and in general, um, uh, what is going on with the coverage of Ukrainian Jewish relations in um, Israeli and uh, especially in Israeli media, um, I would say is below any standards. Uh, people can, when, when people talk, um, um, uh, I would say, not scholars, but, uh, you know, ordinary people in Israel, um, uh, think about um, uh, what is going on uh, with the Jews in Ukraine and how to understand Ukrainian Jewish relations over the last 30 years. They continue operating with stereotypes uh, that were outlined by uh, Nathan Hanover in the 1650s, um, according to which, uh, you know, uh, Ukraine is a Judeophobic country. And um, uh, when uh, Ukrainians raised to defend their uh, um, uh, national sovereignty uh, or ethnic sovereignty, uh, they start killing the Jews. Uh, well, Ukrainians are defending their national sovereignty during the um, Orange Revolution in 2004, uh, Revolution of Dignity of 2014, and uh, during the uh, Russian-Ukrainian War of 2022. And yeah, there has been no uh, attempts to uh, murder the Jews. Vice versa, Jews participate actively in this particular um, uh, resistance of Ukrainians um, against uh, the uh, Russian invasion. I'll talk about it in seven and a half minutes. Um, the transformation that I'm discussing shows that Ukrainian people move toward um, a um, new conceptualization of Ukraine um, as a nation state with European values and with a strong pro-Israel pro position. Uh, of course, you would tell me that there are many examples to the country, uh, that uh, there are uh, multiple anti-Ukrainian articles appearing in uh, Israeli press uh, across the, the border. Mariv, uh, um, Haaretz, uh, Israel Hayom, uh, and I can, I can mention other sources. And of course, uh, you can mention that Ukraine is not consistently pro-Israeli uh, pro uh, because Ukrainian diplomats uh, in quite a silly manner, with which I, you know, I agree with this uh, kind of assessment. Uh, assessment. Um, uh, they vote um, um, against Israel um, uh, during uh, the uh, many, many votes um, at the United Nations. I agree with all that, but I believe uh, that uh, we are uh, witnessing uh, the the country undergoing. Um, uh, very important uh, changes. And um, um, I do not see this kind of silly vote of Ukrainian diplomats uh, during uh, United Nations discussions of how to deal with, the, uh, with Russia and with the Russian onslaught against Ukraine uh, at the United Nations anymore. So we do see that the war kind of um, uh, intensifies uh, these transformations that I just described. Uh, my second point uh, might be uh, quite counterintuitive. Um, there were voices, Jewish voices, among uh, Ukrainian refugees from the Eastern territories, especially from the Luhansk and Donetsk um, areas. Um, uh, Jews, uh, in many cases, Russian-speaking Jews, uh, in many cases, women with children, um, uh, who moved to Western Ukraine or to Poland or to Slovakia. Um, um, and uh, 
found themselves in the situation when they are uh, when their kids are placed at schools, when they are helped by local refugee organizations, and they are interviewed, um, and they are very grateful that uh, Ukrainians. Um, uh, extend uh, their help to them, but at the same time, uh, when they uh, when they are asked, what is actually going on? How do we understand um, uh, the current situation in uh, eastern Ukraine? Uh, they are saying Maidanuti, Maidanuti, and naturally Vainu. That is to say, the Maidan struck uh, Ukrainians uh, started the war, um, and um, uh, that is, of course, uh, is hundred um, percent uh, Russian propaganda. But it means that these people are imbibed with the Russian propaganda. On the other hand, uh, we do see uh, voices um, uh, from the opposite side. Uh, take uh, my colleague uh, uh, Maxim Huan, um, the professor um, of political science uh, from. Uh, uh, the university uh, in, at uh, Rivne, um, who says uh, um, that, you know, I'll, I'll put aside uh, my um, titles as a full professor. I do not want to use any dispensations. Um, uh, I would draft, uh, I, I, I would like to uh, to uh, become a draftee and fight at the front. And this is what he did. And when he is interviewed, he says, um, I must do what I preach. And um, uh, he exemplifies kind of an, the opposite uh, uh, side of the spectrum uh, of a Jew who is actively participating in the um, uh, uh, military resistance of Ukrainians against the Russian um, uh, aggression. So my point is very simple. I'm trying to say that Ukrainian Jews are divided along the political, geographic, uh, uh, geographical, uh, sociocultural, and linguistic lines as everybody else in Ukraine. Uh, there are uh, Ukrainians and Jews uh, who are uh, not associating themselves with the, uh, with the Russian Federation, who see themselves as the uh, Russian-speaking uh, citizens of Ukraine, uh, but who, uh, who are uh, very much contaminated by the Russian propaganda and who see uh, uh, those defenders uh, of uh, uh, those, I'd say, one million defenders of of the uh, Maidan during the Revolution of Dignity, as people who provoked uh, the war uh, against Ukraine, and there are people uh, on the uh, opposite side uh, who uh, associate themselves uh, with Ukraine to the extent that they say they are ready to die for it, and there are you know dozens, of um, uh, maybe hundreds, hundreds of of um, um, uh, Jewish and Ukrainian um, opinions um, in between, uh, people who are strongly supporting Ukraine but who are not ready to um, uh, to die at the front, uh, they are uh, collecting money uh, for the um, uh, Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, there are people who are fleeing uh, just because they do not consider this war uh, um, uh, the war uh, that they should be part of, and so on and so forth. So. Um, um, I believe um, it is important to see that um, um, as Ukrainians, uh, Jews tend to identify with um, uh, at least three, uh, but of course not two cultural and geographical parts of Ukraine. So we are talking about East, Center and West. Before 2014, and also uh, in, uh, on the eve and in the wake of the revolution, uh, the Orange Revolution of 2004, there has been a lot of discussion uh, in the Western media that Ukraine is a divided country. Uh, uh, anywhere from uh, Zhitomir Kiev to the east, it is pro-Russian. Anywhere from uh, Kiev Zhitomir to the west, um, it is uh, pro-Western. Um, and it is this split that caused uh, Ukrainian upheavals. Um, it became clear in 2014, 2000, uh, excuse me, 2014 and 22 that uh, that conceptualization of Ukraine is uh, flatly um, uh, uh, not true, and that Ukraine has at least three uh, cultural geographical areas, east, center, and west, and yes, east, uh, uh, Luhansk, um, Donetsk, to a lesser extent, uh, um, uh, Zaporizhia uh, and of course Crimea are more uh, Russian speaking and more oriented uh, toward uh, Russia. Uh, there is, um, of course, pro-Western 
um, uh, Ukrainian West, uh, especially Halicina, uh, Galicia, but there is also the center, and it is this center where Ukrainian upheavals uh, uh, took place, and uh, the occurring upheavals uh, showed that uh, the Ukrainian center is, of course, uh, pro-Western, um, and uh, that is um, a very important change uh, in our understanding of what Ukraine is about. So Jews can belong to different clusters, this cultural geographical clusters um, of, um, uh, of Ukraine, but Ukrainians too. So Jews kind of um, participate in the society um, and uh, they reflect uh, the changes and the stratification uh, of Ukrainian society at large. So before the war, um, before February, uh, let, let's, let, let me, uh, let me um, you know, uh, go with the uh, majority vote. And if we decided that the war started on the 24th of February, 2022, um, uh, you know, just for the purpose of this conversation, I'll support this viewpoint, although I'm of a different opinion. Uh, so before the war, the division of three types um, of, of, Ukrainian, uh, of Ukrainian into three types uh, was mostly about the level of Russification. To, to what extent you are ready to speak uh, Russian and not Ukrainian? Um, and of course, um, uh, it was also about uh, uh, your attitude toward Ukrainian national strivings. Um, yes, Ukraine should be a sovereign country. Yes, Ukraine should be a European country. No, Ukraine should uh, find a better balance uh, between what Russia is about and what the West is about. However, um, in many cases, in many cases, if not in all, it was not about political alliances. So even the Russian-speaking uh, Ukrainians and uh, Ukrainians who were more, who were, you know, arguing for a better balance between what Russia and the West is about, and Ukraine as kind of intermediate in intermediary position, even they uh, did not um, question, uh, by and large. Uh, their political alliances. They wanted Ukraine to be an independent country. And that uh, has not changed. I would say uh, that particular uh, vision um, uh, has become predominant, uh, if not the absolute overwhelming majority vision in the West, in the center, and also in the East. Um, during the war, uh, this understanding of the dangers of identification with the Russian language and Russian culture became part of broad uh, self-awareness among Ukrainian Jews and among Ukrainians, and many more people started to identify with the national independence and armed resistance. Um, uh, so, um, uh, as we'll see in, as I promised, in seven and a half minutes, Jews from Zaporizhia, Kharkiv, Odessa, and Dnipro um, um, are identified today with the Kiev-centered uh, military and cultural resistance to um, uh, Russian uh, aggression. And if they speak uh, Russian language, Jews and Ukrainians, if they speak Russian language, it does not mean uh, that they are oriented toward Russia uh, politically and they identify uh, with the Russian aggression against Ukraine on the Russian side. So what are the immediate uh, ramifications of, of what I just mentioned? There is no such thing as Ukrainian Jews, as clearly identified um, entity that one can measure uh, through the um, ethnonational categories of Jewishness by the ethnonational yardstick. Jews in Ukraine are as much Jew, Ukrainian Jews as Ukrainian Ukrainians. Jews and Ukrainians share with one another a key political, social, and cultural concerns. And Jews are successfully integrated um, in multicultural, diversified, and polyphonic Ukrainian society. Um, my next point um, is also kind of um, counterintuitive, but I promise that um, I will develop this counterintuitive points rather than you know, discuss what you uh, would all agree with. Um, I have a friend who was a, a priest, um, and he was a Jehovah uh, Witness uh, priest, um, and he was ordained, and he worked as a priest for some time, and then he decided he doesn't want to be a priest, he wants to be a Jewish studies scholar. And he uh, wrote his dissertation on Targumim, on Aramaic translations of different biblical texts, and he is uh, today perhaps uh, the top scholar of uh, uh, Primishnaic Hebrew and Aramaic language in Ukraine. And he's a professor at the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv. 
and he is my uh, uh, buddy and my good colleague. Um, and um, during um, uh, an exchange, we, we had a conversation a couple of months ago, and I'm asking, what is he working on? And he says, I am translating a prayer book into Ukrainian. I was, I could not believe my ears. The point is that if you go to any synagogue uh, um, in Ukraine, and most synagogues in Ukraine um, are uh, to this ex or, or that extent uh, belonging to, um, I'd say majority of them, uh, to Chabad or to different other trends uh, of Hasidic movement, mostly Chabad, uh, Chabad in, in uh, Rabbi Schneerson and Rivne, um, Rabbi Glitzenstein in, in Chernivtsi, um, uh, Rabbi Moskowitz in Kharkiv, uh, Rabbi Kamenetsky in Dnipro, and I can continue this list, I would not do that. Uh, but the point is, you go into any synagogue, you take a prayer book, most prayer books would be Hebrew Russian, right? There are no Ukrainian prayer books whatsoever. And the fact that uh, this colleague of mine was commissioned, he was commissioned uh, to prepare a Ukrainian language uh, uh, prayer book, that is a bilingual prayer book that would have, you know, Ukrainian part, not the Russian part, um, uh, shows a very important uh, switch that happens in the minds of Ukrainian Jews, including those Ukrainian Jews who are not born in Ukraine, who are coming from Brooklyn, uh, Monsi, uh, Montreal, uh, Bnei Brak, uh, and other parts of the world to Ukraine uh, 10 years ago, 30 years ago, to establish uh, new Jewish communities there. So what is this trend? Um, um, it is a trend from imperial and post-imperial identities to the identification with Ukraine as a nation state, uh, Ukrainian national symbols, uh, Ukrainian um, cultural, linguistic, and military resistance, and of course, with Ukrainian language and culture. Uh, you will tell me that this is true about Ukrainian society at large, uh, that moves toward a consensus that it should be, um, that it should build itself um, as a nation state with a pronounced um, anti-colonial drive. And I agree with that. So again, here we do see Jews who are in the mainstream of the um, social transformations that appear in Ukraine. But what interests me is that um, um, there is a rising number of Jews in Ukraine who switch to Ukrainian language and which is particularly fascinating, members of uh, Ukrainian Jewish intelligentsia who had always been the first and foremost consumers of the Russian culture in Ukraine, uh, they are uh, more and more identifying with Ukrainian language and culture. Um, uh, I would even say that the rejection of the Russian culture um, to, in Ukraine today is more radical among Russian-speaking Jews than among Russian-speaking Ukrainians. Um, the ratio of Jews participating um, in the military, frontline supply, refugee organizations, volunteer NGOs is four or five times higher than the ratio of Jews to the Ukrainian population. Um, and um, of course, you can question my numbers. I can tell you how I'm counting that. Um, uh, in the situation of war, when everything is classified, it's difficult to do any kind of um, accurate quantitative um, uh, calculations, but, but I'll, I'll give you ideas. Um, uh, think about that. Uh, uh, Vitaly Portnikov, uh, the leading uh, Ukrainian uh, TV journalist. Uh, Leonid Finberg, um, uh, the um, publisher, the, the, one of the two um, heads of the Duhi Litera uh, um, uh, publishing houses in Kiev. Uh, Yosef Zisil is the head of the Association of the um, Association uh, of, of uh, Jewish Organizations and Societies of Ukraine, um, Va'ad of Ukraine. Uh, Matvey Weisberg, uh, the leading uh, Ukrainian um, uh, painter of Jewish descent. Um, um, Rigori Folkovich, um, a Ukrainian uh, Jewish children poet. Boris Kersonsky, uh, a major Odessa-based uh, Russian language, um, uh, predominantly Russian language uh, Jewish poet. Um, um, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, these representatives of, uh, of Ukrainian Jewish intelligentsia switched to Ukrainian language and associate themselves more and more with the Ukrainian culture. Um, uh, they uh, speak Ukrainian in public. Uh, they they uh, publish uh, uh, Ukraine op-eds um, uh, on the web, and uh, which is you know uh, uh, quite amazing. Um, uh, poets who are kind of um, 
unthink whose whose legacy is unthinkable uh, you know outside of of, of the linguistic milieu um, and um, cultural traditions uh, that um, uh, they inherited these poets uh, switched to Ukrainian language not only Falkovich and Khersonsky but also uh, I would mention uh, a fascinating um, uh, uh, poet uh, of uh, Israeli Ukrainian uh, Jewish origin Alex Averbuch, uh, who switched entirely to the Ukrainian language and works um, as a Ukrainian uh, poet today. So um, about 14 years ago, I published a book um, about um, dedicated to a number of um, uh, Ukrainian poets and writers of Jewish descent who were born to Yiddish and Russian speaking families, but decided to become Ukrainian writers. And for me, uh, these cases were unique uh, representatives uh, and they were re re representative of, of um, kind of um, uh, unique choices made by Ukrainian Jews among whom majority chose Russian language. Um, and uh, I called the book, uh, The Anti-Imperial Choice, The Making of the Ukrainian Jew. And uh, many people, uh, and I need to be frank with you, myself included, uh, looked at this book as a description of uh, uh, some exceptional, very interesting, very important, very influential, but exceptional cases. Now we can talk about the anti-imperial choice of, uh, I would say, 99% of Ukrainian Jews that became ubiquitous, that characterizes Ukrainian Jews by and large. So um, uh, these points um, that I'm trying to make, uh, of course, show that Jews in Ukraine uh, reflect the transformations that happened in the society at large, that there is an increasing tendency among uh, the Jews to embrace Ukrainian social, sociocultural, and political, uh, if not sociolinguistic identity, and that more Jews in Ukraine acknowledge a distinct character of Ukrainian cultural identity and embrace it. Um, before the war, uh, people could speak Russian, people, I mean, Jews in Ukraine could speak Russian, could speak Ukrainian. And uh, there is a famous um, uh, statement, I would say infamous statement by uh, President Zelensky, uh, who um, uh, spoke uh, Russian, predominantly Russian before February um, 2022. Um, and uh, when he was challenged, he would say, you know, what's the difference? Russian language, Ukrainian language, I'm Ukrainian president and I identify with Ukraine. Well, this kind of um, an answer is impossible today, either from a Ukrainian or from a Ukrainian Jew, including President Zelensky. That doesn't work any longer. There is a consistent drift away from the identity of Homo Sovieticus. There is a consistent drift toward the Ukrainian cultural identity. You know, my penultimate point is uh, very brief. Um, I spent time in Ukraine in September and in December last year. And um, um, I remember staying, um, I remember standing at, at, uh, at the uh, Ukrainian um, uh, cultural center, cultural hub, um, architectural site uh, at the center of the market square, Rynek Square in Lviv, um, quarter to four, December 13th. Um, and um, I am on my way to uh, the book presentation. I have to present the book. Give me one second. I have to present this book, uh, Jewish Architectural, The Jewish Architectural Legacy of Lviv, uh, that my uh, senior colleague, uh, Yuri Biridov, uh, wrote and that uh, your most humble um, edited and uh, brought to publication. Um, so um, the a presentation of the book has to be at the uh, very centrally located Museum of um, Ethnography um, in Lviv, um, and the presentation is at four o'clock. Quarter to four, uh, there is a siren. Everybody has to go to the shelter, um, and um, I think that, okay, I'll make my way, you know, five minutes, six minutes um, to the museum, and um, I'm sure there is a shelter because I don't know where there are shelters, uh, bomb shelters in the center of Lviv. So there is an air raid um, and there is a threat of um, uh, Russian missile and um, um, aircraft uh, military strike. Uh, so um, I am uh, going to the museum and lo and behold, nobody is in the shelter. And there are 70 people among who 99.9% .9 um, are um, uh, Ukrainians. 
0.1% uh, 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 is myself. Um, and everybody is interested in listening uh, to the book presentation uh, about Jewish architectural legacy in Lviv. Uh, what I'm trying to say, among Jews and non-Jews in Ukraine, there is a growing interest to inter-ethnic relations and uh, to the Jewish past in Ukraine. Uh, top Ukrainian publishing houses issue novels, history books, diaries um, connected to the Jewish past in Ukraine, first and foremost, the Holocaust, uh, or books uh, uh, such, as, uh, such as this one, uh, which has been published with a circulation of 1,000 copies, which is a big uh, number uh, for um, a scholarly book um, in Ukraine. And within 10 days, the book disappeared from um, uh, uh, from the book stores, it was uh, uh, it was purchased uh, in uh, Dniprocher, Nivtsi, Kiev, and Lviv, and uh, the publisher had to um, uh, really uh, make an effort in order to find last twenty copies that uh, remained after ten days um, um, after the uh, book publication, because everything else was sold. It shows you the um, the level of interest in the war times toward a Jewish past uh, in Ukraine. Ukrainians are actively involved in the creation of their own version of the usable Jewish past, uh, particularly about such topics as uh, Jewish collective farms in southern Ukraine, Jewish participation in the build-up of Ukrainian People's Republic, 1917-1921, um, uh, Babin Yar and the Holocaust, uh, Jewish writers and thinkers from Ukraine, anywhere from Agnon and Fransos to Ilko Borshak, and, uh, who is um, a famous Ukrainian um, historian of Jewish descent uh, who lived in France, and Yaakov Orenstein uh, from Kolomea, who, who was, uh, you know, um, who single-handedly published, you know, 90% of Ukrainian literature in uh, Western Ukraine, um, in, in Austria, and later in Germany. Um, so these people are uh, in the forefront of uh, of uh, uh, the uh, discussion, and uh, they are uh, uh, books are on them, and their books are in great demand um, um, among the readers um, of um, of books in Ukraine. Um, uh, of course, Ukrainians are deeply engaged in shaping uh, the collective narratives um, about Jewish past in Ukraine. Uh, it doesn't mean that there is a consensus. Uh, there are uh, productive debates on all levels, how to evaluate and want to think about Ukrainian Jewish relations in the past. Um, and you have plethora of uh, versions from revisionists uh, version of, um, you know, um, uh, Jews who, you know, let's say, um, uh, allegedly um, uh, caused uh, the Holodomor, the famine in Ukraine, and old stereotypes about two solitudes that Ukrainians and Jews lived um, separately in Ukraine and never interacted with one another, um, um, to a very different conceptualization um, uh, of uh, interactions uh, of Jewish and Ukrainian, of Jews and Ukrainians on all levels, uh, music, art, theater, literature, uh, uh, politics, uh, science, scholarship, and so on and so forth. Um, and um, uh, these plethora of, of, of versions of the usable Jewish past shows that uh, there is no attempt to kind of emphasize one uh, and suppress another. Uh, so um, if, for example, in the Russian Federation, uh, there is definitely a, a um, centralized, well-controlled, well-shaped um, uh, governmental uh, intrusion uh, into the creation of this usable past narrative, there is no such thing in Ukraine, which is a pluralistic and uh, democratic and kind of uh, created bottom, uh, uh, bottom up. Uh, my last point is very brief one. Um, perhaps many of you know that um, the uh, war started uh, uh, with Putin claiming that he's coming to denazify Ukraine, that Ukraine is a country ruled by uh, drug addicts and, and the Nazis, uh, Naziki as they say, um, and that uh, all Ukrainian government uh, is uh, composed of this Naziki. So Putin is a great redeemer who is purportedly coming to redeem uh, Ukrainians and also Ukrainian Jews from this um, um, uh, Nazi uh, ruled uh, regime as he calls uh, it in Kyiv. Um, uh, so 
what is the reaction of Ukrainians and what is the reaction of Ukrainian Jews? Uh, Jews in Ukraine, as well as uh, Ukrainians in Ukraine, um, emphasize on different levels um, uh, in the streets, uh, in cultural discourse, on, on, um, uh, uh, on the media, that they are first and foremost, not the Nazis, uh, that they are tolerant people with, um, uh, they, they, um, um, they are not xenophobic, they are anti-totalitarian, uh, they are anti-imperialists, they are anti-autocrats, um, uh, they are very much anti-xenophobic, uh, they do not like blackmailing, they do not like um, calum political calumny, uh, they do not like um, uh, uh, any kind of um, um, uh, propaganda based on uh, on uh, national uh, ethnic hatred, uh, the one that uh, Russian uh, Federation supports, propels, and promotes. Um, they are saying we are not Russia, and we do not want to be Russia. So whatever Russian uh, um, Federation does on um, uh, the level of political discourse, we will do to the country. Uh, we do not persecute um, LGBT. Uh, we do not persecute liberals. We do not shut uh, shut down the um, liberal institutions or uh, liberal media. Um, uh, so um, if uh, Moscow, um, uh, within first weeks of the war, uh, shut down uh, such important uh, media outlets as uh, uh, the Echo of Moscow, uh, Medusa, uh, uh, Dorst Channel, and and other um, uh, and other outlets. Nothing like that happens and will happen in Ukraine. Um, uh, Ukraine allows dissenting media. Um, uh, Ukraine embraces ethnic minorities. So whatever happens in Russia, we will do the opposite. So my point is that external factor today plays an enormous role in increasing uh, in, in increasing this self awareness and shaping Ukrainian Jewish identity and Ukrainian identity too as a whole. Uh, uh, so. Um, uh, it is, of course, not clear if this new identification is sustainable in the poor war, in the post-war situation, whether it remains or disappears once the external enemy um, is removed. But I do see that uh, Ukrainians and Jews in Ukraine know very well what they do not want to be, rather than they what they are. Um, and um, uh, you know, it reminds me of of a famous uh, uh, debate. Um, uh, between the positive theologians and uh, negative theologians um, in 8th, 9th, 10th century uh, medieval Europe, um, when uh, Pseudo Dionysius, Dionysius Eripagitis, um, uh, said that, you know, everybody knows what God is, you know, God is this, this, and that, and uh, St. Jerome says this, and St. Augustine says that, uh, but I'm saying uh, that God is not this, not A, not B, not C, not, uh, not D, and so on and so forth. So the same thing we do um, you know, witness today um, in the formation of the Ukrainian Jewish identity, where people uh, of Jewish origin uh, who live in Ukraine and who live outside Ukraine know very well what they do not want to be. Um, uh, and uh, of course, they look uh, for this, as Roman Jacobson would say, uh, a principle of negative parallelism uh, on, uh, on Russia. And they say, what they do, we do not do. What they um, are um, 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 uh, building up in their propaganda, we would do uh, the opposite. Uh, what they are trying to make uh, out um, uh, in, uh, of Russia, uh, we will do the opposite uh, in, in Ukraine. So um, uh, Russia uh, is building up itself as a fascist country with an autocratic regime, uh, with uh, the um, 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 uh, absolutely um, uh, subjugated uh, populations that do not resist uh, to um, um, any attempts of the government to make them into share a canon, into uh, in, into um, uh, fodder for, uh, for for the guns. And we will do the opposite. Uh, we will build um, a democratic um, a society with high level of self awareness and with everybody participating in the national build up. So I'll stop here. Uh, I have many more things to say, but I would like to uh, um, leave um, uh, more juicy uh, parts uh, of my conversation for uh, Q&A. Hey, thank you very much, Yohanan, uh, for this wonderful um, 
lecture actually the beginning and we do have a few juicy questions but let me start maybe with less juicy and later we will move to more uh, juicy as you stated so the first one um from Susanna Wind uh she's actually ask, asking and actually this is a good uh good thing to know what percentage of Ukrainians consider themselves Jews as for today can you give some figures please Right. Um, uh, this is a question uh, that uh, Yosef Zissius, um, uh, the head of the VAD of Ukraine, um, has a better expertise in. Um, uh, you know, uh, the question is, how do you count? Do you count according to Sekhnut? That is to say, if your paternal grandfather is Jewish, uh, you are uh, you can be um, uh, you can participate in Aliyah to Israel. Or do you count uh, only on your uh, um, uh, mother's side, uh, and if you are Jewish on the mother's side, you are Jewish. So uh, whatever is the way to count, uh, I would say that Ukraine today has uh, somewhere between 80 to 140,000 uh, Jews uh, who are identifiable as Jews. Uh, uh, there are people who give bigger numbers, I would doubt that. Uh, if we consider uh, uh, that number, uh, we can say that this number represents approximately uh, 420th part of the Ukrainian society. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for this uh, numbers. Um, okay, another question actually um, going towards issues with Israel. So Felice Rocco, she's asking, or she's saying and asking, one of the reasons that Israel is reluctant to give more support to Ukraine is because Ukraine votes against Israel at the United uh, Nations Assembles. Zelensky had no answer when Ukraine recently voted against Israel on that important issue. What do you can say about this? I can say many things, uh, and I would uh, ask, uh, I don't know if um, uh, Zeev Khani, an expert in uh, these uh, type of questions, is listening to us, but I would uh, readdress my question to the top specialist in Israel on this type of question, Zeev Khani, um, uh, and, and uh, he might give a much better answer. My brief answer is threefold. First, we do not know. Uh, one thing is going on the uh, level of political debates. This is how Ukrainian uh, diplomats vote in United Nations. They had, they did not do it at, uh, uh, you know, since the start of the war, at least not that I know about. Um, um, also, we know um, the reluctance of the previous Israeli government to, to extend help to Ukraine and include a military help uh, in, let's say, humanitarian help that uh, had already been offered. Um, we know, you know, only what is going on on the uh, official level. We do not know what is going on on the non-official level. And um, the little uh, I know about it is that there is much more to discuss, and there will be many more interesting things that will surface once the war is over. Um, uh, we will uh, get to know uh, about uh, Israelis who are uh, uh, regularly um, uh, participating in uh, the uh, Ukrainian military resistance uh, to the Russians with their buddies, you know, uh, you know, serving in the Ukrainian uh, um, uh, armed forces. Uh, there are many more um, Israeli uh, consultants and and uh, uh, trainers who are coaching Ukrainian soldiers um, at the front line um, and in the rear. Um, uh, I can give names, but I would I'm not able to do that. So um, there is a military help. Uh, that is being done, that is being uh, provided uh, without uh, officializing and without all of that information going into, into the press. We need, to, we need to keep this balance, and I believe it's good that we have this balance. This is number one. Number two, um, Ukrainians and uh, Israelis, uh, uh, I would say Israelis know what, what Ukrainian Jews do not know and what Ukrainians do not know. And what I have to explain to Ukrainians and Jews in the diaspora on a regular basis, Israel and Russia share the border. Yes, that's, uh, I believe anybody Israeli who, who knows that Russia controls one fourth, if not one third of, of, of Syrian territory and that uh, uh, Russian military patrols uh, the boundaries um, and controls uh, the um, 
um, uh, shipment of military uh, uh, equipment that can come uh, uh, from Iran uh, through different routes uh, to um, uh, to Hezbollah uh, or to um, uh, pro uh, other pro-Iranian groups in Syria. Russia is in control of these territories. So Israel risks um, 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 having confrontation with, with Russia if Israel openly supports Ukraine. That particular resistance of Israelis uh, changes, and we do see this changes. A couple of days ago, um, Israel officially um, uh, claim that there will be um, uh, more military help, not just humanitarian help to Ukraine and Ukrainians, whatever is the uh, Russian reaction to that. And of course, Russian reaction was very negative. So this is a second thing that we have to uh, take into consideration. And third thing is that, uh, look, uh, I'm not training um, Ukrainian diplomats. Uh, I train um, uh, young Ukrainians in uh, Dnipro, Kharkiv, Chernivtsi, uh, Ostroch, Kiev, um, and Lviv. On a regular basis, I teach, um, uh, I have been teaching before the war uh, three to four courses um, at different universities in Ukraine, like uh, four credit, full fledged courses. And uh, these are people uh, to who I have access and I know how they think and how they feel. These are not Ukrainian diplomats. While Ukrainian diplomats inherited, unfortunately, um, some of the stereotypes. Um, that they uh, learned um, uh, at schools uh, from, uh, you know, dinosaurs uh, of the Soviet Cold War era who are still teaching them, that is also changing. And we will see more of changes. And the war is intensifying these changes. I would, uh, you know, look how Ukraine uh, is, uh, how um, uh, how Ukraine is uh, um, voting um, um, at the uh, United Nations um uh, over uh, last couple of weeks, and and what would be um, uh, uh, what would be the um, vote of uh, Israel on different uh, um, uh, resolutions of United Nations uh, about uh, Russian aggression in Ukraine um, in the next couple of months? We have to to balance uh, what is going on, what has been going on, against what is going on right now. Again, things are changing in front of our eyes, and we should be able to detect and um, appropriately evaluate these changes. Felice, I believe I'm answering your question. Yeah, I believe as well. Thank you. Uh, okay, and now let's go to more juicy questions. Um, so Tafi Sasson uh, is asking actually two questions and I will read them, uh, both of them now. However, they are separate. Um, in your historical overview, why did you not mention the Ukrainian collaboration with Nazi genocide? genocide actions against Jews, as well as the second question, in the transformation of the Ukrainian society, society you speak about, is Khmelnytsky reputation as a Ukrainian hero being reconsidered as well? Okay, let me start with Khmelnytsky. Uh, you know, uh, the questions you are asking um, um, uh, obviously demonstrate that you think that there is um, a consensus about Khmelnytsky and about Ukrainian collaboration in Ukrainian society. No, there is not. There is none. And even uh, the greatest Ukrainian uh, national bard of the 19th century, Taras Shevchenko, had very critical attitudes toward Khmelnytsky. And, uh, you know, uh, we just have to read the books. We have to know something about uh, Ukrainian attitude uh, to their national heroes um, and to the history of this attitude uh, beyond the stereotypes. Both questions that you asked me show that you are relying heavily on stereotypes. What I can suggest, um, my colleague from the University of Toronto um, and myself uh, published a couple of years ago this book that was published in Ukrainian and in English, and it starts exactly with the stereotypes uh, you know, what Ukrainians think about uh, Jews, what Jews think about Ukrainians, and everything that you mentioned, uh, you know, the stereotypical picture is there. So your question is there as a stereotype. So this is what we start with. And we go, we take uh, uh, the point from there. Take the book. Uh, unfortunately, um, it exists only in English, or fortunately exists in English and Ukrainian. Uh, take um, uh, English language edition. Um, it is available uh, from the Toronto University Press or uh, from Amazon.com, uh, and you will get uh, answers to your questions. Um, there has been absolutely no consensus about Ukrainian um, collaboration um, um, uh, during World War II. 
um, um, especially in Western Ukraine. And you have uh, revisionists who are saying, no, Ukrainians did not collaborate uh, in the mass murder of the Jews, a uh, point of view uh, presented by um, uh, historian Vietrovich, kind of a, a more right-wing uh, historian with who I disagree on most points, but he is an important public figure and he does uh, many good things. So we have to take him seriously. And of course, uh, you know, his opponents, um, uh, such as uh, my interlocutors, my buddies, um, uh, Artem Kharchenko or uh, Yuri Rachenko, especially Yuri Rachenko, who have a very different understanding of uh, what the collaboration is about. Uh, there are several um, uh, journals on uh, the Holocaust in Ukraine published in Ukraine in Ukrainian language that uh, that um, are trying to reconstruct what this collaboration was all about. We do not have consensus even, even among the Western historians uh, who, how, when, uh, and uh, to what extent collaborated. If you tell me about Ukrainian Hills Polizei, well, we have new uh, uh, vision of what Hills Polizei was about. It was not Hills Polizei, you know, uh, auxiliary police. Auxiliary police uh, was based on the territorial principle, not on the ethnic principle. People who were wearing the uh, uniform of Hills Polizei, Ukrainian uniform of Hills Polizei, could have been Hungarians, Poles, Ukrainians, and Russians. And there were probably many more uh, Russian POWs who joined Hills, Ukrainian Hills Polizei than Ukrainians. Um, uh, my graded student who is studying uh, Ukrainian collaboration um, uh, just came out uh, with, a, with a paper um, uh, based uh, heavily on uh, unknown primary sources, where she proves that Ukrainian nationalists who kind of propagate Ukrainian nationalism with the xenophobic um, uh, political slogans uh, found it very difficult to penetrate uh, auxiliary, auxiliary police um, and um, other Ukrainian military units uh, fighting on the side of, of the Nazi Germany. So who were these people? Um, it turns out that they might not be, you know, self-aware Ukrainians. They were somebody else. So um, I'm just throwing all these questions onto you to show that, no, there is no consensus. There is no consensus among Western scholars. There is no consensus among Ukrainian scholars. So your conviction that, you know, all Ukrainians participated, or most Ukrainians participated in the um, collaboration uh, on the Nazi side um, against um, uh, uh, Ukrainian Jews, against Jews in Ukraine, simply doesn't hold water. And I would add to that, that um, uh, if you look at the list of uh, righteous Gentiles, uh, of different countries uh, at Yad Vashem uh, who participated in saving the Jews, Ukraine would, would be uh, on the fourth or fifth um, uh, position there, uh, not on the 10th, not on the 15th, okay? So that is also something to take into consideration. I believe I am not answering your question, but I am at least giving you ways to think about your question in a broader historical perspective. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Yifanan. Uh, so actually, being uh, around the subject, subject of the Holocaust, I will I will read another question from Rani Gotkin, actually a very good one. How does the Ukrainian Rani, Rani the, the the person is Rani. Rani Gotkin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, how does the Ukrainian education system teach the Holocaust specifically that there was okay there was many collaborations? I will not quote everything. Not only during the Second World War. Uh, the, the Second World War, but also uh, during post-First World War period. So do you know anything about the uh, formal educational system, Ukrainian system teaching on Holocaust? Right. So uh, there are universities that have courses on the Holocaust uh, uh, taught uh, almost regularly. Um, and um, in most cases, these are private universities. Uh, there are universities that invite people to come and teach about the Holocaust. Um, uh, Polytechnical Institute and uh, Polytechnical University in Kharkiv, uh, uh, Dnipro University, uh, from which uh, the great historian Serhii Plohi uh, 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 graduated. Um, uh, Ukrainian um, uh, Catholic University in Lviv, uh, Chernivtsi uh, uh, Fitkovich National University. Uh, National University Kiev Mohila Academy, uh, or Kiev University sometimes. So you have uh, uh, not all, but many universities that do teach um, uh, Ukrainian Jewish uh, issues and um, and the Holocaust and include uh, the discussion of the Holocaust uh, into the curriculum. Sometimes it is done, again, from a very um, a revisionist perspective. Uh, Germans came 
uh, took the Jews, killed them. Ukrainians have nothing to do with that. Uh, there are um, um, viewpoints uh, on a much more sophisticated level with the discussion of collaboration. Um, there are courses um, in Ukraine for the school teachers uh, in Dnipro, uh, the Holocaust Center, and in Kiev, uh, Holocaust Center, you know, kind of educational centers that train teachers to teach the Holocaust. And um, hundreds of teachers uh, over the last 20 years uh, were trained um, to include Holocaust in the discussion uh, of 20th century history and history of Ukraine. Um, and, and they take that uh, to schools and uh, to the uh, universities. Uh, there has been no official inclusion of the courses on Holocaust um, into uh, Ukrainian educational curriculum. Uh, but uh, this is also something that uh, uh, is not carved in stone. It is being changed. Um, and it is being changed due to the activities of different centers for the study of the Holocaust and to the activities of the new generation of Ukrainians um, uh, who are uh, writing their dissertations and publishing um, about uh, the Holocaust, the collaboration, Ukrainian Jewish relations um, during the Holocaust and, and, and after, um, and to the activities of, uh, due to the activities of um, uh, Ukrainian scholars uh, already established who also uh, dedicate their work to this subject matter. And there is a lot um, of uh, things published in Ukraine um, on, um, on these themes. Uh, again, Ukraine has two Ukrainian language journals uh, dedicated to the Holocaust. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, I need to say one thing. I see that Tafi Sassoon is, is writing um, something to everyone. I'm not able to follow the chat. I, I have too many things in the chat, and I just cannot answer questions and, and look at the commentaries on the chat. So if you want to make your commentary, uh, send me a message uh, to my email, um, and... Um, I'll think about it, but I'm I'm just not able to uh, to comment on your statements. Yes, next question, please. Sure, thank you. Um, Geraldo Farrington uh, is asking following: Given that Zelensky is Jewish, how do you characterize the potential for non-Jewish Ukrainians to scapegoat Jews for Russia invasion, regardless of the final military outcome? Has Zelensky already successfully overcome this potential? Okay, two things. Zelensky is as Jewish as I am Catholic. Um, and I am joking only, uh, you know, partially. Uh, Zelensky has been before February 2022 a homo sovieticus. Uh, Russian speaking, very little uh, Ukrainian self awareness, very little Jewish self awareness. Um, understanding of his Jewish legacy as the legacy of his Russian-speaking Jewish parents, uh, uh, very much uh, sympathetic to the Russian culture, uh, thinking about uh, Russian um, uh, media outlets where he can present his movies and so on and so forth. Uh, I deny uh, uh, any kind of uh, deep Zelensky's Jewishness or Ukrainianness before February 2022. What happened to, to the man after that date is the transformation of a, home, of a homo sovieticus into a person with very high level of national self-awareness. There are people who discuss uh, this, um, you know, new Zelensky, um, but they do not understand that the, the role and the significance of this particular transformation. Um, this is number one. Number two, we have to take into consideration that uh, Zelensky came um, uh, uh, to lead the country um, after uh, Petro Poroshenko. And Petro Poroshenko um, emphasized the importance of three things um, uh, that are absolutely necessary uh, for the construction of successful Ukraine. Um, uh, military prowess, uh, that is to say army, um, uh, Ukrainian language, and, um, and unified Ukrainian Christian church. Um, uh, and Poroshenko did enormously, uh, uh, did, did, did enormously important things to have these things happen. Um, Zelensky, um, in order to say that he is different, um, really deprecated all three points on the program of Poroshenko and deprecated publicly and privately and in a very nasty way. 
Um, um, uh, many people criticize uh, Zelensky, and I do identify with the critique that Zelensky really did not allow Ukrainian military to develop such things as Stugna and Neptune and other types of, of missile and anti-rocket systems. Um, he thought that this is uh, not important, that he will agree with Putin on major things, and there will be peaceful decision to any problem. Um, uh, the moment the war started, Zelensky had to switch to Ukrainian. So one point of uh, the program of Poroshenko that he deprecated, he had to embrace. Um, he immediately started to look for ways to um, uh, replenish um, uh, Ukrainian-made um, uh, armament, uh, not only bringing things from the West, but also to make sure that Ukraine starts producing its own um, armament. Uh, so another point of Poroshenko program that he disdained uh, he had to embrace. Um, and once he realized that the um, uh, Ukrainian church of Moscow patriarchy, a very influential ch church, one of the four uh, types of Ukrainian Christian churches uh, uh, in Ukraine, um, is actually a fifth, uh, uh, a fifth column uh, that, um, you know, brainwashes its parish uh, with the um, uh, uh, outward uh, Putinist propaganda. Um, is doing that successfully uh, uh, and is not penalized for that, he realized that uh, the Moscow patriarchy um, really runs and rules this Ukrainian Orthodox Church and it has, and this has to be stopped. So another point of Poroshenko's program that Zelensky again uh, marginalized and uh, kind of mocked uh, has to uh, he had to embrace and take seriously. So the situation of war made Poroshenko's plans uh, oh, the central piece of the uh, Zelensky's plans. Uh, so, of course, he has to be criticized for uh, uh, his negligence uh, before the war, but he has to be absolutely praised that what he is doing right now um, is uh, extraordinarily important. And I do not envy him, and I do not imagine anybody in his place being able to play his role uh, seriously with self-dedication as he is doing right now. So seeing him accused of uh, Russian aggression, well, he downplayed it, definitely. Um, and he has to be criticized for that. Uh, scapegoating him, calling him a Jew who did that to Ukraine doesn't work because he is, again, I'm returning to my first point. Before February 22, he, uh, 24, 2022, he was as Jewish as I am Catholic. Next question, please. Thank you very much. So actually, we have still time for two other questions, and let's come back to for a while to Israel. Susanna Wind again. Uh, she's asking, "Do you see who, who is asking? Who is asking? I missed. I missed the, the name." Susanna Wind. Mm -hmm. okay. Wind that depends how how which pronunciation mm -hmm. you are using. Yeah? yeah. If it's Polish, so it will be Wind. If it's English, so it will be Wind. I know um, who's I know who is she. She doesn't know that I know. I know who is she. Yeah, please continue. Do you see Israel as a valuable moderator for peace between both countries? No. I don't think that um, uh, that one country can be a, a moderator between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, several countries, uh, the leaders of several countries, um, uh, offer their help. Uh, I don't see one country being able to do that. Um, and I don't see that any kind of mediation um, is needed um, until uh, the last Russian soldier uh, leaves uh, the Ukrainian territories uh, captured starting from 2014 and Ukrainian um, uh, territories reestablished in its 1991 borders as Russia promised to respect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for this great answer. Uh, and actually kind of similar, but I mean, as it um, as it is uh, connected to the lately um, events in Germany, you know, with this anti-war, so-called anti-war um, movement and protests, uh, Alessandria Alio, she's asking and also uh, stating that maybe it's a bit naive question, but... Yeah, why I see. It? I see it. Yeah, don't don't repeat why, it. I see it. 
Okay. Why is it not? I, but I need to. Uh, I need okay, to uh, outreach for others. Uh, why is it not possible to stop the war and just resume conversations? Right, uh, Alessandra, who would stop the war? Uh, Ukrainian soldiers, Ukrainian society? Absolutely not. Uh, more than eighty-five percent of Ukrainians uh, are resolute and adamant on on this issue. They have to. Uh, liberate uh, the territories conquered by uh, conquered about to make that. number one. Um, uh, uh, number two, Russians, Russians, yeah, uh, Ted, are you saying something? Excuse me, yeah, no, no, no. Uh, Russians are not ready to stop the war either. Uh, there has been absolutely no uh, desire on the Russian side to stop the war. When they are saying, you know, let's start the conversation, there is more bombing of uh, 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 Ukrainian civilians um, and uh, Ukrainian infrastructure uh, uh, by the Russian missiles. So it is uh, it is fake. R Russians are fakers right now. And um, uh, they, they would say, yeah, we are ready to talk, but they are not ready to talk. They are not ready to any kind of... Um, um, uh, peaceful conversations with Ukrainians, and the only uh, uh, the only condition on which they would start any kind of conversation is that the Ukrainians agree that the territory right now controlled by the Russians is Russian Federation. Nobody in Ukraine would agree to that. So there is uh, there is nothing to discuss. So uh, there is um, uh, you know we would want Alexandra and I uh, to resume conversations. Nobody in Russia and in Ukraine would like to do that. And I do not see that happening. Uh, and, and also uh, among the uh, big political leaders, there is uh, there is a consensus that you cannot stop uh, the military activities right now and, and uh, uh, resume conversations, particularly because Russia wants to uh, resume conversations only on the basis on their imperialist uh, um, uh, politics of annexation um, um, and uh, Ukraine is fighting the war of uh, national liberation. You cannot bring to the same table, uh, you, you cannot bring to the, ta to, to the table um, uh, one side uh, that has a war of attrition and another side that has a war of national liberation. It doesn't work that way. Thank you very much. And I think this was really a good question and good answer uh, to end our uh, lecture and Q&A session. Uh, by the way, we don't have any more uh, questions. So anyway, we exceeded the usual time of this, um, this lecture. So Johanan, thank you very much. Thank, uh, you. Except... Uh, thank you. Thank you to Deosh. Uh, and, and um, uh, you know, um, I, I see many, uh, many comments there, uh, yeah. folks. Uh, I thank you for these comments. I'm just not able to look them through and they will disappear the moment uh, we'll finish this Zoom course, session. That's why you're, that's I'm, why glad, you're... I'm glad that, that this conversation um, uh, made you think and ask questions and, and uh, you know, reevaluate what we know and, and how you see things. If this is what I achieved, um, I, I think that, uh, that, uh, that you made my day. Thank you. Actually, this is, yeah, this is exactly what I wanted to say that except of those questions we have also a lot of comments mostly positive a lot of people saying thank you for a fascinating lecture so i think we all really learn a lot today and let's hope uh for uh this war to um to stop soon and the right part to win and um yeah and good luck to everyone thank Slavo you all the best thank you all the best